mentioned that today we'll talk about browsers, how it's, uh, what, what exactly happens in a browser and how it shows on the screen and also how it make us better developers. Uh, so first of all, uh, I, uh, first of all, I want to mention a great call, quote by Paul Irish that a web, a web developer learning the internal of, of browser operation helps you make better decisions and know the justification behind development best practices. So more than 10, more than 10 years ago, Internet Explorer was the most commonly used browser and it was kind of mysterious. But now with open source browsers, uh, it's a good time to take a peek under the engine hood and see what's inside a web browser. Currently, browser user interfaces have a lot of common with each other that it was earlier. Uh, browser UI doesn't have any formal specification. It just comes from good practices shaped over many years of their evolution. So basically browsers imitating each other, uh, which made so many common details with them. Nowadays, Chrome is the most popular browser in the world, so I will, uh, will take the Chrome as the target browser in this presentation. Uh, first of all, we just run through the basic components for the web browsers. Um, there is a picture of its structure. So number one is the user interface. It's pretty explanatory. It includes the address bar, back forward button, bookmarking menu, and so on. Every part of the browser display except the window where you see the requested page. Number two is the browser engine. Marshall's actions between the UI and the rendering engine. Third one is the rendering engine. This is actually the focus of this presentation. This engine does a lot and a lot of stuff and we will talk about it more. Mainly the rendering engine passes HTML and CSS and, and display the parsed content on the screen. For and next is the networking block, um, it, which it is a key component that the rendering engine uses. It is used for network calls such as HTTP requests using different implementations for different platforms behind a platform independent interface. The fifth component that the render engine uses is the JavaScript interpreter used to parse and execute JavaScript code. Um, six uh, is the UI back used for basically for drawing. For example, you can tell uh, the UI that you want to see a rectangle and you're going to see it on your monitor. Underneath, it, it uses operating system user interface methods. And last but not least is the data storage. This is a persistence layer a uh, browser may need to save all sorts of data locally, such as cookies. Uh, browser also supports storage mechanisms such as local storage, index DB, web SQL. So that completes it for the basic overview. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to focus on the rendering part of the browser. There are a lot of different components, as you have seen. But rendering is so complicated that we are really, it's, it's really good to focus on it. Uh, the rendering in Jill will start passing the HTML document and convert elements to DOM nodes. And it is called, as you know, DOM tree. One cool thing about this step, since HTML is really very flexible and parsing is also very flexible. Often developers make HTML with some errors, for example, we forget to close text or misspell something, or the nesting is not so quite right. So, so actually, HTML. So, if you forget something, it will not break the whole page because there are a lot of errors check-ins. So, it lets the browser be flexible. Also, uh, the engine will parse the stale data, both is both in external CSS files and in style elements. Styling information together with visual instruction in the HTML will be used for create another tree. As you can see, it's in the bottom of this, of this slide, it is a render tree. 
The render tree contains rectangles with visual attributes like colors and dimension and so on. As about, as about Chrome. In Chrome, there are actually several different types of layers uh, which are connected with the DOM tree. It's a render, so it's also with the DOM, it's render layer, graphic layers, and, um, and uh, as you can see, render object which connect DOM tree with layer tree. Uh, after the constru uh, construction of the render tree, it goes through a layer process. This means giving each node the exact coordinates where, where it should appear on the screen. And as you can see, the next stage is painting. The render tree will be traversed and each node will be painted with the UI backend layer. This is the rendering process. The browser takes elements and rasterizes them in a paint step. The rasterized elements are put on layers and they are placed together to finally show it on the screen. So it is called a uh, compositor. Uh, sometimes layers will be created without being aware of it. So it, there can be create multiple layers. So each browser implements the layers on its own way and nothing ensures that this feature remains in future. So there are different, uh, some situations which let the layer, uh, additional layer can be created. For example, uh, layer is used to create uh, like for video element is um, using accelerated video decoding. Uh, layer is used by canvas element with a 3D context or accelerated 2D context. Uh, layer is used for a composite plugin. Also elements with CSS animation, elements with accelerated CSS filters and uh, also, element has a, the sentence that has a compositing layer. Um, and the last one is for element has a sibling with a lower Z index, in, index which has a compositing layer. In other words, there is, uh, the, uh, in, in other words, words uh, it's rendered on top of the composite layer. Also, it's a ver there is a very useful tool to see those layers in the Chrome. It's, uh, it is uh, in a flag layer borders. It is in the uh, dev tools under the reading heading. It's very, uh, it's very simplified highlights uh, where la layers are on screen. So you can see the layer consists of sub rectangles. They are called tiles. Uh, if appendix tiling and an active tiling share the same piece of context, they share the same tile. If there is an in validation, a new tile is created. So after activation, the, on, uh, the active only tiles will unregister themselves with the tile manager. Um, so this is also representation of the tiles uh, on, the, on the Chrome. So it's Chrome also groups the pixels into tiles to enable smallest and fastest updates to the screen. So previously, Chrome would redraw any of these tiles and had been modified by a DOM update. But this is only optional if the majority of tiles area needs to be redrawn. Also, I want to mention the very, uh, the one thing for rendering, it's, it's, I would like to say about uh, rendering performance. So to write performance sites, and apps, you need to understand how HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, CSS is handled by the browser and ensure that the codes you write as efficiently as possible. Nowadays, scrolling should be stick fast and animations and integration should be simply smooth. So as you can see, um, as I also mentioned on a, present, uh, on, on a slide that most devices today refresh their screens 60 times a second. If there is an animation or transition running on the users is scrolling the page, the browser needs to match the device's uh, refresh rate and up uh, one new picture or frame for each of those screens refresh. Um, so 
each of those frames, so we have uh, time phrases and um, it has a budget or just over six, uh, 16 milliseconds. But your work needs to be completed inside 10 milliseconds. Why it is, right, uh, why it is written in the present? It's because uh, six milliseconds of this time frame, um, the browser has some another housekeeping work to do. So in the end, we have only 10 milliseconds for it. So when you fail to do it in this time frame for rendering the page, the page will just freeze. So it's, it's called as junk and it's, it is not good for the user experience. And for example, you can mention it for, the, um, for some apps when you're scrolling, if there is, can be some chunks. Uh, so it's because, because of this uh, rendering performance. Um, also, I want to mention about the, uh, the pixel pipeline. So uh, there are five main things that you need to know about and be mindful of them you are. Um, these areas can be controlled and they are key points in the pixel to screen pipeline. So first of all is uh, JavaScript as it is used to handle work that will result in visual changes. Style cal calculations. So um, this is the process of figuring out uh, which CSS rules applied to which element based on matching selectors, layout, paint, as we mentioned before, and compositing. Also, uh, mostly it is, it is not necessary to touch every part of the pipeline on every frame. So there are other two ways of it. The second one is when you changed only paint property like a background image, text color, or some shadows, and it doesn't affect the layout on the page. Then the browser just skip layout, but, but it will still do paint. If you change the property and will, it will not affect layout or paint, the browser um, just do compositing. So for example, here is like, uh, it's the, so, this, this uh, the third type of it is a defined version of the cheapest and most desirable for apps life cycle, life cycle like it's like animations or scrolling. So um, I would like to say that uh, we should work with the browser and not against it. So uh, let's take a look uh, on a common issues as well as how to diagnose and fix them. So to make uh, rendering smooth and um, as, uh, to make rendering smooth. Badly uh, time or long running JavaScript in, is a common cause of performance issues. So um, as I, I mentioned, so it's good practice is to minimize its impact. And on this uh, presentation, I would show that why, why uh, as we have heard that uh, set them out or set interval is why it's bad. So we heard it a lot, but uh, but why is the problem of it? Uh, so frameworks or uh, samplers may use set time out or set interval to do visual changes like animations, but the problem with it that the callback will run to some point in the frame. As we have mentioned before, we have frame only 16, 16 milliseconds. Possibility right at the end. And that can often have the effect of causing us to miss a frame. So as we mentioned before, it can cause junk. Um, when visual changes are happening on the screen, you want to do your work at the right time of the browser, which is right at the start of the frame. So the best alternative for set time one and set interval to uh, prevent this junk, as we mentioned before, uh, is to use um, function request animation rate. It's the best way to make your JavaScript will run, will run at, at, this, uh, at the start of a frame. So uh, in this way, if you want to use it, um, set them out or set them for or something, it's, it's necessary for you, it's better to use request animation frame because uh, it's the best way to prevent um, kind of junks. Uh, JavaScript 
runs on the browser's main thread right alongside style calculation layout and its many cases paint paint uh, if your JavaScript runs for a long time, it will block uh, these other tasks, potentially causing frames to be missed. Uh, so you should be tactical about when JavaScript runs and for how long. In many cases, you can move pure comp uh, computational work in web workers, and it doesn't require DOM access. Data manipulation often good fit for this model, as are loading and uh, model generation. So also it's good practice to use Faborhas to prevent um, kind of junks. Um, when accessing a framework library on your own code, it's important to access how much it costs to run the JavaScript code on a frame by frame basis. It is especially important when uh, doing performance critical animation work like transitioning or scrolling so it, on a, this on this screen you can see that uh, you can use the performance par, uh, panel of Chrome dev tools and it's uh, the best way to measure your JavaScript code uh, uh, also I want to mention about CSS it is also good practice uh, uh, to reduce the complexity of your selectors. Um, it's a good practice to use methodology kind of like BAM, reduce the number of elements which style calculation must be recalculated and uh, measure your style recalculation costs. Um, also, uh, there are two way factors in, in this area about stick Stick to composite only properties and manage lay layer uh, count. So um, there are two key factors in this area that affect page performance. Uh, the first one is the number of composite layers is going to affect the performance that needs to be so they need to be managed. And another factor which can affect the performance is the property that you use for animation. So it's in a good practice, it's um, uh, uh, composite. Uh, it, it's a, it's in a good practice that uh, we know that we should create um, an, another uh, layer. It's uh, promote moving elements with will change or translate Z, uh, stick to transport and opacity changes for animation, and and the third, the main thing is we should also avoid overusing those promotion rules. Layers require memory and management. Um, so uh, this is also for us about to layer count. So it's, uh, so, uh, so this, uh, you know, this is what can be used to create additional layers, which um, can, will be very helpful in development. So this is this is it. That's uh, how how the browser renders. So um, in this, the scope of this presentation, I wanted to show uh, how how it's how it's work how it's work on under um, how 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 it works inside and also um, the basic things with we should do to provide some some things like junks. So. Also, I have added uh, credits for this uh, presentation. It is attached uh, to this presentation, and um, maybe after the, after this presentation, you will take a look for it. So, so thank you, thank you for for your time, and thank you for hearing this 